talking uh, the host. We're talking uh, a monster on the loose in South Korea. And this is a, a Bon Joon Ho film. Um, the host, hugely successful, uh, hugely influential, and um, it's uh, spun some uh, some sequels, some remakes, and just to sort of generally, uh, it's had a huge influence on the monster movie. Um, uh, you know, in the last sort of decade or so, uh, the host was released in two thousand and six. Um, but what I like about the host is it's a monster movie that's actually really good, and I think you'll find that you will uh, enjoy with me the experience of watching the host, uh, certainly on the big screen, which is the uh, the proper the proper place to be watching uh, a, the, a monster on the loose. And, um, the, I mean, the CGI, I mean, CGI dates quickly, but, um, uh, I think, I think it holds up pretty well, the CGI in this film, uh, I've got to say. Now, here, here you're looking at a couple of the posters, and, um, I think what's interesting about, uh, the host and the promotion around the host is the way that it's actually, it's not really sold as a, a South Korean film. Right, so you know when you're watching a lot of films like a like an Ozzy film or uh, you know like a sort of your your Wong Kar Wai kind of Chunking Express or in the Mood for Love or something like that, it's all about we're going to give you this experience of Asia and we're going to show you um, this you know authentic uh, nostalgic Asia and we're going to take you from you know wherever you are in the world and we're going to put you in this little space in Asia. And the thing about the host is it, it's kind of like it's very South Korean in politically what it's saying and things like this, but it's extremely universal and it, it works on a, on a universal level. And because of that, the film is very accessible and the posters would suggest that that was the marketing strategy um, where uh, it's, it's, it's referencing not one, um, but two uh, Spielberg related films. Um, now, Jurassic Park, uh, you know, um, was the the updated Spielberg movie from Jurassic World. But of course, Jaws. Uh, no one can deny the great monster movie in Jaws. Um, and they're they're both on one of these posters. Scary, funny, poignant, and political. It's Jaws via Jurassic Park. Hugely entertaining. And Total Film said that. And they're an American. Um, that's an American publication. So what you're seeing uh, uh, in these posters is uh, the monster in various places and um, the city, city in chaos with water. So it looks like a nice city uh, to visit. And that's the host. Okay, now, what should I expect from South Korean cinema? And um, the reading for this week, which is very good reading by um, uh, Ben Goldsmith and... uh, uh, well, he, he talks about the, the, the South Korean blockbuster and um, how the host kind of represents um, the kind of current and contemporary uh, blockbuster. Oh, well, you know, the, 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 the sort of, to understand South Korean blockbuster, watch the host and you'll get it. And he says, blockbusters loaded with digital effects have driven the transformation and internationalization of the Korean film industry in recent years. Now, what he's banging on about in the article, which I, I think I've said is a good article. I'll say it again. It's a good article. He talks about the, what South Korea has done in order to internationalize itself and bring in this kind of global audience is actually think outside of South Korea in the making of their films. And... Um, the host team actually employed uh, digital effects experts from Australia and the United States, and um, it, it doesn't mention it in the uh, in the article, I don't think, but it should, and um, maybe that's a bias against their good friends in New Zealand. And hello to anybody um, listening or watching from New Zealand, and um, I want to acknowledge um, not only New Zealand listeners um, to this lecture right now, but I also want to acknowledge. That New Zealand, they made the monster that appears in the film. They're all over that. So um, congratulations, New Zealand, for doing that. And thank you very much. Now, the point uh, of South Korea 
uh, is that you know they're often outsourcing the effects and things that they can, you know they don't really have uh, the experience to be doing in South Korea, and they're kind of doing that. Um, you know, they're, they're they're sort of working with other countries, and they're not so much uh, co-productions. They're more just the fact that um, in uh, you know, in other countries, they have the facilities that maybe, you know, they don't have in South Korea. So rather than make something that seems a bit um, kind of amateur or dodgy, you know, they're quite happy to work with um, countries outside of South Korea. And it, it's paid off dividends in a film like The Host, which is just terrific, and it feels terrific. And, you know, what, what the article's really talking about is the fact that in, um, you know, if you've actually got personnel from other countries working on the film, they kind of bring their own cultural understanding and awareness to the film, which allows it to feel more global international. And therefore, people from that country, you know, audiences from that country kind of engage with the film in a, in a particular way. That's the claim of the article. When you're watching the host, the question is, are you engaging with the film in a way Um that makes you feel like, yeah, yeah, it's a, you know, it's an Asian film, it's a South Korean film, but it's kind of, it's a film that I'm really kind of getting um, easily, and I don't really have to sort of engage with, you know, a whole kind of um, Asian culture to understand what's going on in the film. Yeah. Um, and um, the article goes on: the film mixed elements of film genres familiar from Hollywood and Japanese cinema principally the science fiction and monster genres with aspects of traditional and modern Korean culture. That's something to think about when you're working yourself through. Uh... Okay, now, the international success. Now, according to industry estimates, the film attracted 13 million viewers nationwide. That's nationwide in, uh, in Korea. It became the top-selling film of the year in Korea and recouped the bulk of its estimated production budget of 11 million from domestic uh, ticket sales alone. So the film did very, very well. And um, importantly, uh, you know, when you're talking about kind of internationalizing of Asian films and, uh, you know, things like that, uh, the film was distributed in markets around the world, including the United States, the United Kingdom, Japan, and Thailand, resulting in an international box office record for a Korean film of over 87 million. By 2007, so that's uh, that that that's a big film, and for uh, for an Asian film to be able to do that is um, huge, huge business. So we're kind of talking, you know, Mad Max, the Mad Max Fury Road of the South Korean cinema. And like I said, uh, the thing about the host is it's really kind of influenced and also set um, a new level of where the monster movie has to go. So, you know, it's a good benchmark. Uh, monster movie, how does it compare to the host? Uh, now, does the film feel global? And what is the Asian experience? I mean, when we're watching the film, you know, does it feel like, you know, we're getting some sort of Asian experience? Or is there some sort of, um, you know, kind of generic thing going on in the film where perhaps it doesn't feel uh, Asian at all? And is that a problem, or is that actually just tops that it's doing? Uh, Bong's decision to employ technical ex expertise from outside Korea circumvented the typical requirements of co-production treaties, requiring a certain percentage of production to take place in each of the countries that are parties to the agreement. Right. So, um, I mean, the article uh, that you're reading this week, you know, really goes into great detail um, regarding that. But... You know, there is a lot of um, international expertise sort of working its way into and across the film. Um, uh, something that I think we should all be aware of is that um, Korea and Australia have actually had a very happy relationship in filmmaking. Um, maybe not such a happy relationship, uh, you know, in political reasons, or political policies of each country, um, but certainly when it comes to the movies, everyone's getting along just great. So my answer to the political problems um, in the world is that we should actually just be coming together and making more movies, because clearly there seems to be a happy medium when we're making movies. Everyone seems quite happy. International countries, you know, different countries, we're going together. So that's my answer to. Um, 
you know, to solve the problems of the world, make more movies together. Because, okay, um, now, um, Goldsmith, you know, he talks a lot about this, but he, you know, in, in other articles, not just this one, but, uh, you know, the fact that Australia has actually, um, and Australia-based firms have played significant parts in Korea's cinema, cinema's internationalisation. And that's, I, I think, important to know because, um, you know, a lot of um, South Korean films have done very well uh, in Australia and other Western countries. Okay. Yeah. Um, the film, you know, did really well in America and Americans feature in the film, right? So the question I have is um, how does America feature in the film, you know? And um, I sort of, I mean, Americans are more present in this film than, say, a film like Grave of the Fireflies. Uh, but there's certainly this thing of the Americans on the periphery of actually what's going on. Uh, now, does the film feel American? Um, some criticism uh, from, well, certainly from within Asia and South Korea, was that the film was so wanting to be loved by America and American audiences. And is that a problem? And do you feel um, do you feel that problem, or do you feel that the film is um, wanting to be American? And um, you know, if a film's really pushing itself into international markets, does it lessen its own um, national? importance or national identity or national representation. Okay. Uh, does the film feel accessible for an American market? Uh, I want you to watch this film and just compare it to other films in the course um, that have represented America. There have been quite a lot and uh, have a think about that. Now, what's interesting about uh, the host, I mean, if I have to convince you to watch this film, um, which I shouldn't, because uh, you're all very conscientious students, and I look forward to seeing you in the screening. Um, now, the film appeared on several critics' top 10 lists of the best films of 2007. Um, I'm sure also on the list in 2007 was uh, the great film of, um, of, of, this, uh, of this century so far, There Will Be Blood. Just a phenomenal film. And, um, and No Country for Old Men also. Another fantastic film, but the host also appears on the film on the on these lists, and all of these lists are American lists. So you've got the Boston Globe, the Washington Post. All right, it goes on and on, right? And uh, you know, second, second, fourth, fifth. So this film is doing really well, not only on a commercial level, but actually on a critical level. People are watching this film and being really blown away by just how good it is. Right, it's good. It's actually a it's a it's a monster movie that's actually good. It's amazing. I, I like. I'm 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 surprised that I'm even saying that because I don't like monster movies. Generally, I'll be honest with you. I don't like them. They don't do nothing for me. I sit there and it's just like I'm being assaulted for two hours by images on the screen, and often the cinemas are so loud, my chair is vibrating. I don't know if that's an intention of the film or if just the sound is so loud, my chair is vibrating. But I don't really enjoy being assaulted at the movies, right? But this film, assault me all day because I really think it's a wonderful film. It's beautifully constructed. It looks so great. Like, it just looks incredible. And the performances are really, really terrific. Okay, now, um... I'm going to talk about space. So here is an image of um, of the monster. Now, when you're watching it, um, I just want to put this out there, and um, what the other article talks about this, that when they were creating the monster, they were really um, interested in um, Steve Buscemi's um, role um, of this kind of creepy uh, criminal in the Coen Brothers' wonderful film, uh, Fargo, um, which was, um, you know, mid to sort of late 90s. I think it was about 96 or something that film came out. And so that they wanted the, the monster to look like Steve Buscemi in Fargo. So the question I have is, does, Steve Busch does the monster look like Steve Buscemi in Fargo? Does he act like Steven Buscemi in Fargo? I, I don't really understand what they're banging on about at all. But um, maybe, you, maybe you'll find something something of um, discussion 
And uh, maybe that could be that could open up a wonderful uh, talking point in the classes. Um, the the Steve Buscemi monster. Uh, space is an object of consumption. Now, what do we learn about the spaces we are shown? All right? Think about that. It is very much... So if you've got a monster running around the city, and I mean, that's the amazing thing about this film. It's not like, you know, a rural film where the monster's just going crazy, you know, in rural like places. It's like he's in the city just, you know, fucking shit up big time, smashing stuff, going... It's crazy. But the thing is, if you've got a monster chasing everybody around the city, what you're essentially doing in a film is showing the city. Like the city is on display, right? And it's about showing the spaces. So you look at a film like Offside, right? Where you've got two um, characters and, you know, they, they just want to get to a, a, a soccer match or a football match. So what they're essentially doing is they're traveling across the city and the film is traveling with them. And what you essentially get in a film like that is this um, like travel log on the city. And this film also is a travel log on the city. And I think those two films are really kind of interesting to have a think about. If you haven't seen Panahy's Offside, I highly recommend it. Uh, wonderful film. And this film also, it, the way it uses space is really, really interesting and quite smart and intelligent. What I really like is you always feel like you know where you are in the city. Even though a lot of it is actually you know, in interior, yeah, which I like. Um, yeah. For the characters, the spaces are familiar yet dangerous. They become the surrogate viewer. Right. Think about that. Um, now, what is the, this film um, genre category? Now, it's not really a horror movie. Uh, it, it's, sort of, well, it, it's a monster movie in that there's a monster on the loose and he needs to be caught. Um, it's essentially a film about a family. A family coming together, an estranged family coming together, and kind of working together. Um, and you know, I mean, there are other Spielberg films um, uh, which, which sort of come to mind regarding families and other um, creatures or things from other planets, other spaces, um, like War of the Worlds being a really, really clear example um you know we're doing similar things I, I feel like the film is kind of channeling that spielberg family idea that he always has at the center of his films it's kind of a road movie for reasons i said in that it's just people running and monsters chasing them and it's sort of a military movie as well um but it's a great it's actually a great character study of these members of the family uh really think. okay uh now yeah. um so here's a quote, and uh, the quote is, The host is a loose, almost borderline messy film, one that sometime, sometimes feels like a mashup of contrasting, at times, wearing movies, methods, and moods. Mr. Bong would as soon have us shriek with laughter as with fright. But it's precisely that looseness, that willingness to depart from the narrative straight and narrow, that makes the film feel closer to a new chapter then a retread. Now, isn't that interesting? So he's saying that in the article, um, it's this, which is the New York, New York Times um, review of them, um, that because it's loose, you know, the film feels kind of loose and it feels a bit kind of schematic, like in that you don't really know where the film's going, you don't really know where the monster's going, right? And you don't really know how it's going to all end for anyone. Right, what that actually does, it 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 offers the film to go to a different place with the monster genre and the monster movie that then that's normally um, felt, um, you know, with with such uh, with, with such kind of the cle you know the usual cliche of the monster. Movie. Um, how would you describe the setting? How is it sh um, shot, framed? Uh, so, what sort of city is this? Does it feel familiar uh, in the city that we're seeing? Who owns the point of view, and does it shift? Um, does the monster ever get the point of view? Do we ever give the monster the point of view? Um, how's the camera used when doesn't it follow the central leads? How is sound used to exclude us and the female characters from this male terrain? I mean, the monster movie generally is a very male place and space. 
right? But in this film, um, it you know there's a, a very strong female um, thing going on. You know, j just the, you know a number of the central characters are female, and it doesn't. It feels again that's sort of subverting what we come to expect um, from the cliche of the monster movie, um, how our exterior locations use. And also, what's it saying about South Korea? Um, I wrote Japanese people on the run, but obviously I was meant to write um, South Korean people on the run. Okay, uh, final thought. Uh, just have some think about the pace, the colours, the sound, the setting, how our clear binaries established. And there are clear bi binaries. Uh, how is colour used, um, the camera... And, you know, of course, what is the Asian experience of this film and um, how does the film um, culturally and socially position itself? Now, Asian authenticity, right? Is this film authentic, authentic Asia? Now, this is going to sound a bit bonkers because there's clearly a monster in the film chasing people around and I, I would assume that in South Korea, there aren't kind of monsters on the loose chasing people around. So that's a kind of, kind of you know, a, a fantasy of the cinema. But what is authentic about it? Does it feel authentic? Do, do you get a sense of South Korea, South Korean culture, South Korean people through this film? So have a think about that. And um, have a think about the idea that the monster is meant to resemble uh, Steve Buscemi's character from Fargo. Um, and if you if you have some opinions on that, um, let me know. Um, and I'm trying to make sense of it myself. All right. Um, all I want to say is you're in for a, a hoot and good time with the host. It's a terrific uh, movie. It's fun. It's actually got depth in places and at times when you don't expect it. The dialogue sharp. Uh, the performances are good and the monster, it, it, it actually, it, it's just so good what they do with the monster and the way that they, they use the monster. They never overuse the monster, but they don't kind of hide the monster back also. It's just, um, it's just, it's, I just love the host. I, I love, you know, I'm, I'm just saying it here and I'm going to say it probably before I show the film. So um, enjoy the host with me and um, I look forward to um, doing that with you. All right, that's it for me. Bye for now.